right, one to the two, two to the three, and the place to be. It is the Impact Lounge. It is the Impact Wrestling Review. It is BQ. It is Ro. It is Adam. We're talking Impact Wrestling. We're not the only people to do this, though. You can also check out the Heel Cast. Look up the Heel Cast. They're on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, YouTube. Andre Corbeil is out there. Posts a lot of great content to his YouTube every day. And, of course, there is the uh, Impact Lounge YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the Impact Lounge. Make sure to subscribe there for lots of great Impact Wrestling content. And today's review is brought to you by the Fight app. If you're listening on YouTube, you can go in the description, download the Fight app. And all you got to do is download it, set up a profile, and you'll be supporting the show. You don't have to purchase anything at all. All right, fellas, good to have you on board this morning. As always, we're going to jump to Adam right away. I want to get your thoughts on Bound for Glory real quick. Ro and I already reviewed this show, so uh, I want to get your thoughts on Bound for Glory. Okay, I think like pretty much uh, most people out there, um, it wasn't what I was hoping it was going to be. Um, some of the matches were downright awful, um, especially the Great O Abyss one. Uh, wow, that's what I can say about that one. Um, about the quality of the wrestling, not so much the booking. But overall, it was fine. I would like to have, have seen something, I don't know, bigger happen. Uh, I think the best thing that came out of it, well, I enjoyed the, the street fight, the 5150 street fight. And although I'm sure we'll talk about it, about this impact, uh, I also like the fact that they have done a double turn. Um, I don't know if that was mentioned on the review show or not, but it seems to me now that LAX are turning face and OV have gone full-blown heel. So that, that was, I think, the best thing that came out of the show, if I'm being honest. Uh, it wasn't a brilliant pay-per-view, certainly wasn't in the... The top 10 bound for glory is bearing in mind has only been 12. Uh, that pretty much summed up how I feel about it. Yeah, um, I, I really think what it boiled down to, and Ro and I had said the, the wrestling and the, the effort was all A+. Plus. I mean, I don't, I, don't think, uh, I don't blame anything on the wrestlers whatsoever. It was just a lot of overbooking. And I, I, I want to go on a limb and say there was a lot of last-minute changes. There's no doubt in my mind that Laurel, when she hit the... Uh, and prettier on, on Grado that that was supposed to be the finish of the match. No doubt in my mind. And, you know, they added Rosemary to it. And they did some things that were just, I think, at the last minute, they they made some decisions that I don't think really paid off. And I, you know, I compared it to, um, you know, I play a lot of fantasy sports. I'll get my lineups done. They're all good to go for the entire day. And then I make a last minute change and it just messes up the entire lineup and I lose all my money and, you know, I, I really think that that's what happened overall, but um, I'm going to give it a second watch and see if I think anything different of it, but it didn't quite deliver on every level that we had hoped. The, the one thing I have to say that I haven't seen the ending of it because my DVR cut out uh, on, on the taping. So I basically saw uh, Alberto pull the ref out of the ring and then the, it stopped. So I actually haven't seen the ending, if I'm being honest, brutally honest, but uh, I think you're right. The, there was a bit, quite a bit of overbooking in it. But I don't actually mind that. What I don't like about wrestling in general is when there's no consistency or when storylines aren't followed through. And, you know, a lot of what's coming uh, going forward, it seems that way. And, you know, we, I know we're not going to talk about spoilers of the tapings and those things. We're going to talk about the TV product. But, you know, they, unless I missed it, but there didn't seem to be a mention of Jim Cornette missing, for example. You know, and that's a pretty big thing. Uh, did they mention it on the show? Or? They just completely went away with it. But, I mean, in all honesty, when the when the tapings kicked off, it was very Jim Cornette heavy. And then through the rest of it, he he played a very small role. I mean, he can, at this point, fade off into oblivion. And, and you know, it wasn't like he was cutting a promo in the middle of the ring every show. No, no. But at the same time, I, I think he was the authority figure, wasn't he? And now that has just disappeared, which is... Why I say, you know, the consistency, at least they could have explained why he's gone. And uh, and it's those kind of things that annoy me uh, about Impact. I don't mind a reboot every set of tapings. If that's what they want to do. <laughs> but at least but at least acknowledge what's gone on before and why it's not happening going forward. That that's, It's that consistency piece. But anyway, uh, I don't want to be too down on it. They got a show out there. I, I think if you paid money for it, it was OK. Yeah, it was fine. But uh, they've put on better shows in the past. Right, and the last thing I want to say about it, I think um, 
overall what kind of hurt it was that you know they pre-taped so much content obviously to where when the the pay-per-view actually rolled around it wasn't near how they promoted it so like there was no father james mitchell there was no additional members from lax there was no km ringside for the knockouts match um i, I think that was probably the initial intention when bound for glory is going to be in orlando but they made that decision after the tapings are already <laughs> completed so that's that's kind of what hurt it but we're going to get into the topic at hand impact wrestling We've been down on the last three weeks. This episode, to me, was great. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it from top to bottom. I would imagine, as we're reviewing it, I might spit out a couple things here that I didn't like. But off off my head right now, I didn't dislike anything on the show. Really love the uh, brawl at the end. I just I just love it all. Ro, what do you think about the overall episode of Impact? Yeah, um, I enjoyed it as well. Um, you know, my big thing. You know, after any pay per view that Impact produces, is always the post show because that really can set the stage of where they're going to go moving forward. And uh, this this show was off to a great start. Um, I'm very optimistic about the new creative team. I mean, there's probably only one minor thing that I didn't like, but even so, like you know, the show overall from top to bottom for me at least was was uh, well put together. Fully agree. Um, yeah. I- I, it's a, it's, you can tell already it's a different direction that they're going in. You can tell already the creative team have got a vision of where they want to go. And it is in stark contrast to where we've been, which whether that's a good thing or not, I see how it plan, pans out. But, uh, yeah, the show overall I thought was very, very good. And, and it doesn't it help when you've got a good crowd there? I mean, wow, what a difference. Yeah, huge, huge difference. And I, I just like the overall layout of the show. It was just everything made sense creatively, even the stuff that – you know, maybe two weeks ago we would have said, what, what the hell is that? That's random as hell. But everything was just delivered really, really well. So let's kick it off. It kicked off with Eli Drake doing an in-ring segment talking. And, um, you know, we, we talk about we don't really like the opening talking segments a whole lot. But when it's Eli Drake, he always does a really, really good job. The crowd was very engaged. And the crowd size was, crowd size was not that big, much bigger than the normal impact zone uh during the week and some people have said online well how how, how come you know there's not more people there well you, you got to remember they're taping from 7 30 p.m to 11 30 p.m during the week that is not exactly the optimal time from, for someone who has a life to go out and watch wrestling so the people who sit behind their internet all day you know maybe they can go but it, it's difficult to do that but with that being said, crowd was very loud, very engaged, and I think they fixed the audio issues that kind of plagued Bound for Glory, where they just compressed the crap out of the audience, which was really unfortunate. Um, what happened, you know, in the grand scheme of things here, at the very end, da 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 da, he's talking. Petey Williams comes out. That's done strictly for the pop, strictly for the audience, and that's fine, perfectly fine. Eli Drake says he has the night off. Um, gives all credit to himself for winning that match about for glory needed no help to do it and pd williams came out challenged him for the global championship and that's going to be our main event for next week adam you got any thoughts on the opening segment yeah yeah um first of all eli drake uh promo skills he is a master of controlling that audience and, and there's not many can do that i mean you look at wwe and a lot of people criticize roman reigns for delivering flat promos and those kind of things but he, he just gets it and it's the same with james storm how they can whip up a crowd and just his little interactions and asides you know to acknowledge a few chants and things he's masterful at it um unlike chris masters or adonis next to him who's not masterful at it ironically <laughs> but um yeah it, it was good and yeah I have no problem with pd williams at least it gets eli drake defending the belt on a show in a match where we kind of hope and i'm guessing that he will win clean and show that he should be champ as opposed to uh, another run like magnus who's having someone interfere to keep him the title on him every week so hopefully you know it will be a fairly one-on-one match, a good match um, that, that goes ahead. But yeah, I, I thought it was a good start to the show, really good upbeat, and the crowd played their part brilliantly. Yeah, um, the thing that I was waiting on when he had came out and was delivering his promo, I wanted to know if he was going to acknowledge you know, El Patron's interference. And I know he touched on it a little bit, but the thing I took away is he kind of 
you know, he mentioned it and then he was moving forward. So that led me to believe like, okay, so he has no interest in working a program with him, at least, you know, his character, which I liked. And um, having P.D. Williams come out, challenge him, that's fine. Um, I'm all for having Eli defend the belt against, I don't want to say random random guys but you know various challengers until they can develop or they have somebody waiting you know a baby face to actually challenge him where he can uh, have his next big feud i was just going to say one weird thing actually it just reminded me what you said about uh patron there the the promo for bound for glory wasn't shown in the uk which was really weird um because obviously i read the spoilers uh of what happened at bound for glory and on the uk broadcast they completely cut out the promo from al patron bizarre there you go yeah, we we were talking about that. Um, I I had read in, I had read that online, and I think that's a good thing because that promo was absolutely terrible, and uh, it <laughs> sucked, right. the, sucked the life out of the the audience. You know, I think what happened was they said, okay, we don't have the red wedding match, which is probably going to be a fairly lengthy match, so we're going to throw this um, Ishimori match in there, and El Patron, we're going to need you to talk a little bit longer, and that's pretty much what happened. However, he wasn't prepared. He went out there and he just kept taking an extra five seconds, ten seconds between every sentence to make his point. He tried to draw it out, drag it out. Ugh, okay, let's get let's just let's just get away from that. Um, okay, I think Eli. <laughs> I just don't want to go off any more about it. Um, but Eli Drake, he he needs a good win next week, a good clean win. And I, I don't usually have a problem with heels heel champions cheating to win. That's you know from the beginning of time. That's how wrestling is done but at the same time you have to it's it's kind of like in sports you have to beat the teams you're supposed to beat and and that's the same way in wrestling you got to beat the people you're supposed to beat i have a no i have no problem if he's he's um cheating against a, a james storm or an ec3 or someone who's at the top of the card mm. but x division guys you you're supposed to beat those guys so hopefully he gets a, a fairly decisive victory they, they teased johnny impact throughout the night uh coming and he was pissed off and and <laughs> it was funny because the first thing i was thinking is like he was coming with all this heat and he was so pissed off and i kept thinking like man bound for glory was last night dude you didn't sleep on it a little bit i mean there's times where you're like real mad in the heat of moment but then you kind of sleep it off get up in the morning you're not all fired up and crazy and wanting to kick some ass and push things over so <laughs> but that that's just the wrestling world that's that's always how they deliver it and they really teased something big from the very beginning with that. Um, Jimmy Jacobs was in the booth for for a little bit for the match, which was Matt Seidel versus Sanjay Dutt. And I thought he was actually did really, really well. I thought he, he added a breath of fresh air to the commentary booth periodically. Um, I liked when JB was asking him questions. He's like, don't ask me any more questions. And then Josh was like, so how are you doing? He goes, See there, I don't I don't remember exactly what he said, but he's like, okay, see that guy knows how to ask questions, so I kind of got a chuckle out of that. But Jimmy Jacobs, real real natural, added a lot to it. But the match was, as they always say, X Division implications. That's their way of um, giving us a random match and act, acting like it kind of matters. But it was Matt Seidel versus Sanjay Dutt. I really really enjoyed this. I'm not a major Sanjay fan. Uh, I like I like Matt Seidel quite a bit though. Great X Division match, great back and forth, a lot of innovative offense. Um, anytime we can see the shooting star press, it's great. You know, it's one of those moves along with the Canadian Destroyer. You're just kind of waiting for it to come out. A lot of fun. And uh, before I go to you, Ro, the point I've been making for, oh my God, the last couple months was that every time they want to advance some kind of storyline and it's in conjunction with a match, we always get some BS match. So if this were done, in this last set of tapings with Jared and there and everything, this would have been a two and a half minute match. And then we would have got the long promo afterwards with EC3. But instead we, we finally, what I've been asking for, got a good quality match and it advanced a story. I mean, it, it laid the groundwork for a storyline afterwards. So a plus of that made me very happy. Great match. What do you got on this one row? Yeah, um, it was good, a good match, and I noticed it seems to be, I don't know if it, I mean, I know it seemed like they started to doing it at the pay-per-view at Bound for Glory, but it, it seems to be a theme, you know, every X Division match, you know, implying that there's uh, implications as far as the rinks, and kind of what um, Adam said, 
as far as the rankings, I think the X division would benefit from that. Where when you have these, um, you know, random one on one multi man matches, you know, you can enforce the implications it has as far as the X division um, rankings, and um, I, th- I just think that'd be fine. Yeah, um, the post match, I like it, but it just kind of confused me a little bit because, like I said, they had announced this match had X Division implications, and then you have EC3 come out, and one would assume that he's going to work a program with Seidel. With that said, I'm happy with that because it gives EC3 something to do, it gives Seidel something to do, and I really think that feud. We're assuming it's going to be for the Grand Championship, but we never know because I can't recall the last time he defended the title. But um, that could really kind of help the title kind of get some spark back because they really lost a lot of steam since they put it on EC3, and that's unfortunate. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement there. Yeah, it, it did seem strange that uh, they said X Division implications and then just switched it totally over to uh, the Grand Championship. Having said that, I think I know what the problem is, and that's that JB is just not very good on the mic, and I think he just thinks of things to say to fill dead air. And I, I like uh, Jeremy Borash. I really like him. Company man. He is Mr. Impact. He, I think he's most probably the one guy, if you cut him through the middle, he, he would be Impact Wrestling. And But I just don't think he's very good as a play-by-play commentator. And when they had Jimmy Jacobs in there, you know, it really made a difference. I'm not saying he is a play-by-play, but I do think they need to change up the, the commentary team. But yeah, as far as the match, fantastic. And uh, yeah, going forward. I'd like to see C3 versus Sadal. I think that would be a good program. But once again, you know, it, it seemed a bit random that EC3 came out for no reason and, and picked on Sadal. I, I don't know why that was, but it was a bit random. Um, just, I, I'm sorry to keep going back to, to uh, Bound for Glory, but it just reminded me of the EC3 match. Pagano, is he actually a wrestler, really? He was awful um, in, in that EC3 match. He was terrible. I, like I mean, them. it was like... It was like, the, you know, they got someone from the crowd and said, oh, you, we're going to give you a dream. You're going to be in a professional wrestling match. You've seen it all the <laughs> You can do it. You can do it. And he was, the kicks looked, you know, super. F- anyway, that's going uh, somewhere else. Uh, but, yeah, it's good to see EC3 has, you know, gone back from that face to being a heel again. So I'm glad about that. So he's a better face than, than him. It was really random. But, you know, I was texting Roe, I think it was during the show or after the show or the next day. I don't, I don't really exactly remember. But. As random as it was, I was intrigued. It wasn't one of those things where I was like, oh, man, they just threw some shit to the wall to see if it sticks. Like, it intrigued me. Um, to Just that EC3 was getting a, you know, looks like to be getting a program with someone he wouldn't normally. And that's usually when you blow off Bound for Glory. You know, the next night should have new feuds and new exciting things. One thing they have done the last few years is after, and I, I called this and I was wrong, but after a big pay-per-view, they usually defend all the titles the next night or they have rematches from the next night. And then you don't really care. Um, but they didn't do that this time. They, they almost, for the most part, with the exception of you know LAX and OVE, they started laying the groundwork for, for new storylines and new things. So that was something I was excited for. I mean, I'm ex- really excited to see where that goes. And you know maybe it does something for the Grand Championship. We know that EC3 in real life doesn't care for that title. Um, so maybe this is going to build up that title or maybe it's just a way of getting it off EC3 into the into somebody who can do something with it, with the, with the format and everything. So we'll see what happens going forward with that one. So I, I wanted to comment real quick on this. At first, when they said we're doing a GWN flashback match, I was, I was like, God, here we go. Because they do this during one night only a, not, a lot. And it's always the entire match, and you just sit there and, and and watch a crowd that's fifty times hotter than the one that's currently going on with the with the impact zone. And I just hate when they do that. But this one, this was fun. You know, it show it showed, uh, you know, the good parts of the match. You know, it didn't start from the beginning. It wasn't cutting in and out. It just kind of showed the end of the match. Um, again, really hot crowd. But it doesn't matter if it's Impact WWE, whatever it is. Wrestling fans just don't act like that anymore. You can go back to 80s wrestling. You can watch, you know, WrestleMania 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The level of intensity you see in that crowd, that doesn't exist anymore in wrestling. It's as time goes, you know, there's been independent shows and stuff I'll go to where I'm, I'm very into it. But I don't sit there the whole time and, 
you know, kind of like the video game crowds where it shows, you know, the hands constantly going up and stuff like that. People don't do that anymore. So I thought it was a, a lot of fun. It was uh, Team Canada um, against Sanjay Amazing Red and Hector Garza. Garza Jr. looks a lot like his daddy. It's crazy. But it, it was it was fun. I, I thought it was a good little uh, promo to promote the app. Anyone got anything on that one? Yeah, this was just my minor gripe. Like, it was fine, and I had no no big problem with it. But I just hope moving forward, if they decide, you know, during Impact, if they're going to show kind of these flashbacks, that they're able to pick matches that prominently feature people that are still on the roster. I mean, I know this one had Sanjay, but Sanjay in this match, he was just kind of one of the guys. It seemed like Garza got, you know, was got the biggest uh, shine in this match. So I just kind of moving forward, like one thing I'd love for them to do is, I mean, say when uh, EC3, if, if he's ever challenging for the world title, show when he uh, defeated uh, Kurt Angle for it. Like some of those type of matches that feature yeah. feature feature the uh, um, guys that are currently on the roster now, you know, some of their big moments of the past. Yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. They most probably did it to try and get the WWE fans over because I think half the people in that match are now on uh, WWE television. So maybe it was just to say, you know, <laughs> come, come and see some of their earlier stuff. But uh, to be honest, it's filler, isn't it? You know, I, I would rather see backstage stuff with implications for what's going on there as opposed to stuff that happened 10 years ago. But, you know, uh, to me, it, I don't enjoy it. I, I fast forwarded for, through it, if I'm being honest. <laughs> and normally normally I do, but this one, I don't know. I, I, th- I thought it kind of worked. But to go to, to, you know, to Rose Point, yeah, you, you show some old EC3, some, you know, some Lashley. Not that Lashley has a whole crap load of crazy highlights, you know, his first, first run in the company. But, you know, stuff that's relevant to the talent right now. You know, Shop Impact just came out with an Eric Young DVD and a Bobby Roode DVD. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, that's after the AJ Styles and the Sting one. Like, they, they continue to ride this, oh, you know, let's get the WWE fans' attention. And it backfires on them more often than not even though they have all the right in the world to put that stuff out. Those guys haven't been in the company for like a, a year. So and they spent years in impact. So they have the right to put that stuff out, but they, j- man, at some point they got to f- focus with who, who they currently have at some point they, they just have to. So next match, GHC global champion, Eddie Edwards versus El Hijo de Fantasma. I, loved this match i like both guys you know we got to see they really made this a big deal i mean jb announced the title like he was they were you know defending the impact world championship and they made it a really big deal they didn't they didn't just you know throw it out there like it was just a mid-card match because when the impact guys especially eddie Ward, eddie edwards go to japan you know they're, they're treated with a lot of respect and then sometimes they come to impact pro- programming and they're, they're kind of jobbing or they're just not made to seem like a big deal. This match made a lot of sense given the uh, the pay-per-view and Phantasma taking Eddie Edwards out at the end of the match. So this was, it was just really well worked. I was, it had some uh, drama, had some great near falls, it made the, the championship seem important, the wrestler seemed important and Eddie Edwards wrestled the kind of match he would have been wrestling in, in Japan. You know, when, when they showed him against Marafuji, I'm like, man, why can't we just get that kind of style match on Impact here? It's almost like they're afraid to pull the trigger on actual wrestling sometimes. Enjoyed this quite a bit. Adam, what did you think about the GHC Championship match? Yeah, I thought it was, it was excellent. And you're quite right. The presentation of it is everything. And, you know, this is what they should be doing with their partners around the world and saying to them, look, we'll come and defend our titles. You know, Eli Drake will come over and defend the, you know, the heavyweight championship or whatever it's called, the global championship. And uh, but you present him like a star before and, you know, have reciprocal uh, arrangements. Uh, and the match was was, was great. I, I said weeks ago on, on this show that uh, I thought Phantasma is the high, the star of the AAA guys who have come in. It, you know, he has got a real upside to him. And it was good that at the end of it, there wasn't the usual uh, I'll hold his arm up and then turn heel on him. That was nice to see uh, moving away from what usually happens. Yeah, I liked the match. Um, I, uh, you know, when I seen it was being advertised and, you know, leading up to the match, 
you know, I, I there was no doubt in my mind that Edwards was going to retain. But um, you know, as we were watching watching the match, as I was watching the match, you know, there were some you know parts where it's like, oh dang, Phantasma might pull up the upset. But um, I guess I was just laughing too because I don't know if you guys remember, but um, so sometimes when they're when they have you know people on the impact roster when they're carrying titles from another company obviously they have to approve some of the title changes and where i'm going with this is i don't know if you guys remember but when um team 3d i they had some i want to say is it the iwgp it, one of the titles from japan and they did a title change on impact where magnus and um doug williams they they won the title took the titles from them, and there was this big old backlash about it you know and so I was just thinking about, I was like, man, what if, you know, they put the title on Phantasma? Would, you know, would that harm the relationship? But with that said, um, I like this. Um, hopefully, you know, they're able to do this more instead of giving us filler matches. So, um, yeah, it was fine for me. So the match after this was, uh, it was a squash match, OBE and, and Sammy Callahan versus three ham and eggers, uh, local, local guys. So this match, what I want to say about this, you know, there are some people like, oh, I could have done without it. My takeaway from this was that Sammy Callahan, I, I, I wasn't caring for OVE up to this point. They, he added an element to OVE where all of a sudden I started caring. You know, just even OVE coming down with more heelish, um, caught, you know, uh, ring attire and everything. I don't think the double turn was done very well at Bound for Glory. It's actually, I didn't even realize that's what it was until I thought about it. I don't think it was done well, but I think Sammy Callahan adds some personality to that group because because they have none. They have absolutely none. I think Sammy Callahan really provides that for them. I really like the finisher they used at the end. Like they use, you know, it reminded me of old school wrestling where, you know, finisher with all three guys. Really cool. So, Ro, got any thoughts on the Hammenagers versus OVE and Sammy Callahan? Yeah, I believe that uh, Callahan adds a new dimension to the OVE group. Um, this match was fine. This was to reestablish them as, you know, the baddest dudes in the company, you know, let alone they're the tag champs. Um, I do wonder if <laughs> in the foreseeable future will Callahan still kind of OVE's thunder. I mean, I know a lot of people haven't been high on them, but I don't know him joining the group really, man. Uh, it made me look at o OVE as a whole in a whole different light, but I liked it. Yeah, just just uh, going on the double turn thing, you, you're quite right. It, it wasn't done very well. Uh, and once again, I think that came down to the commentary. I think the commentary should have been selling it, you know, when they were attacking, I can't remember if it was Ortiz or Santana, and one of them was draped to trying to protect him. They, they should have been selling that, saying, OK, that's enough, guys, you know, on the commentary. And that's why the double turn... I don't think it was quite obvious, like you said. But, you know, this week you had Callahan spitting at them in the ring. Well, that, that's pretty heelish, you know. Uh, but, yeah, he adds an edge to them, doesn't he? But going back to the ring attire, something I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, they look so much better in that ring attire than they did in that weird one-armed lycra suit that he used to wear with the hoodie. That was It was just awful. So, yeah, they seem like um, interesting characters all of a sudden, as opposed to bland, vanilla baby faces which they never were so i think they're both in the right roles now i really do yeah he he adds something very special to the group he can talk he can kind of be the de facto leader and those guys can just stand there in the background and it it really really works lax came out after the match huge ovation um it's going to be interesting to see how interesting to see how they book lax going forward as as baby faces they need to um they need to keep that same attitude, but almost be like tweeners, and and hopefully they don't water them down. But I got, I'm not going to be dramatic and say I got chills, but I mean when LAX came out, I felt, I really felt it. I really felt the emotion. And uh, when Homicide came in, and Homicide for the first time since LAX came back has kind of seemed like part of the group instead of a throw-in. So um, and and if, you know Diamante, they didn't bring her because of her injury. So they, you know, they didn't bring her um, to Canada, uh, which is kind of unfortunate. She always, always adds um, something nice to the mix. But this feud uh, continuing, which I'm totally fine with, 
And I know we've you know all mentioned this time and time again. I just hope they have some tag teams or makeshift tag teams waiting in the woodworks because eventually, once this uh, feud ends, you know whoever is the champion, you know we're gonna need some kind of tag division developed. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I thought I and maybe I dreamt this to be honest with you because I don't know where I heard it from, but I, I thought I kind of heard they're going to try to put Seidel and Sanjay together as a team. I thought I, I thought I read that or heard that somewhere, so, you know, it, it could make sense. We'll see. Or they could even use a Everett and a Conley, you know, Cold of Trevor. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's a must. So they tease that Allie being in action, and she took on Casey Spinelli in Border Championship Wrestling. Uh, I wish that it would just say who their opponent is. You know, especially if, if she's going to be a knockout going forward instead of, hey, you know, this person's in action, you know, it, it's not going to kill them sometimes to just say who the opponent is to make the match kind of matter. So, but it was Allie versus Casey Spinelli in Border Championship Wrestling. Enjoyed it quite a bit. Was very engaged with it. It's good to see Allie get some TV time wrestling a little bit more seriously than we see her on impact i think that's going to help her character going forward was very impressed by casey spinelli i always thought she was a lot bigger um she's a thicker girl but next to ali i think they're about the same size or C- casey might even have been a tad shorter i, I think so she she just uh, appears to be be larger like a monster type of character sometimes but it's just because she's a thicker girl she seems pretty uh standard size compared to the other knockouts but i thought you know it's rumored she's gonna be part of the knockouts going forward i thought she looked really really good and had a lot of uh just charisma and and, uh character and and liked it quite a bit but i but i enjoyed this and i've been critical about sometimes when they go to border city or go to go to here and here uh this one i actually really enjoyed yeah um it was what probably my favorite match of the night by far um, only because, you know, I feel with the progression of the Alley character, it's been a long kind of development. So this was, it was nice to have her. And I, I know she's wrestled some matches, but it was nice to see kind of more of an aggressive side from her. And um, I like the Casey Spinelli. Um, if she ends up being a part of the roster, that only helps the knockout division because right now, you know, we're going to need it with the departure of Gail Kim and some of the other departures we've had. But, um, yeah, I liked it. And um, I'm hoping moving forward they commit to the Alley character because I like to believe she's going to be one of the strong contenders for the Knockouts Championship. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, it was one of the questions I asked on, on the last tape conference we did with her. Uh, does she want to kind of move on from this? It's Because it has been over a year now, virtually, isn't it, that she's been this uh, timid character who doesn't really know how to wrestle and gets by so it's good to see that she's beginning to come into her own and be more of a wrestler than just a you know a, a character so yeah I, I liked it the ending was good uh moonsault uh missed obviously and what's it called the death alley no the alley valley driver isn't it so yeah, yeah it's good it was a good finish and good match and yeah uh, hopefully we will see it on uh, the main roster because she uh, she could add something to it i was impressed with that moonsault as well and missed uh but i liked it and uh, I know she's been finishing with the Alley Valley driver, but now that James Storm is gone, we may start seeing the uh, super kick, which she just uses on the indies. And she actually busted that out uh, in Bound for Glory. I think uh, Sienna was hanging um, in the turnbuckles or, or something like that, and she, she actually gave, him, gave her a super kick. So uh, maybe, maybe we'll see her at least move it, using it as a, some kind of setup move going forward, if anything. But, but really good stuff. One thing... Uh, kind of forgot to talk about when it happened. So uh, Hakeem Zayn, winner of Global Forge, has a uh, backstage segment with Mackenzie Mitchell. Hakeem Zayn is a very good promo on his YouTube channel. He cuts a lot of he always cuts promos before his, his indie matches and everything. And uh, he's going to be coming on the show here very soon, so I'm excited to talk to him. Uh, I like it was just a quick segment where he's obviously going to be a heel, which the X Division needs some heels, so I, I think that's a good thing. You know, he said he won Global Forge. He's like, and that makes me important. It makes you just you. And then just out of nowhere, Johnny Impact just jumps him and starts talking. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. So he is a heel then, right? Yeah, I would imagine so. I mean, he's 
his character has always been a heel, so. Okay, because that, that was my, my one thing I was just like, because, you know, he only spoke for a little bit before the attack, and I was like, you know, normally you have a heel be the one to attack this new and up-and-comer, but if they're uh, project uh, displaying him as a heel, then, I mean, I guess it makes sense. It's um, the, the Johnny Impact running in, and, and I'm, we're going to come on to the, the, the brawl in a second, I'm sure, uh, but it, it was hilarious. I, I mean, all night, everything Johnny Impact did, was hilarious but for the wrong reasons because it was it, <laughs> it it reminded me of i can't remember who it was it was bobby rude against someone and they just kept on brawling and it felt like for three shows solid they were brawling every opportunity like, can i remember who it was it was wasn't long ago um i want to say it might have been austin aries or angle or someone like that but they just kept on brawling every time they, they were anywhere near each other and it became like a running joke do, do either of you guys remember what i'm on about I have to go back and look at it. Um, but yeah, jo Johnny Impact just invading everyone and beating everyone up and kicking things uh, was, was brilliant. I loved it. Stupid, but brilliant. <laughs> and the small details that really matter, if he were to jump Hakeem Zayn before Hakeem Zayn even opened his mouth, then it would have made Hakeem Zayn seem really irrelevant. But the fact that he just got those 15 seconds in to establish his character just a little bit before getting jumped. I liked that. That worked. That could actually, even just that little bit, set up a, a match between the two. I'm not saying a feud, but just, you know, a match going forward. I know enough why you liked it as well, VQ, which uh, I, I'm going to out you here on, on this show. The reason why you liked it is because he grabbed the camera just like Happy Gilmore did when he grabbed the camera and was shouting down it. You like that? Yeah. <laughs> like that? that? That's why you like that segment. I know it. Yeah, for uh, for those of you who don't know, um, a few a few of you who are my Facebook friend, I have a uh, a uh, love relationship with Happy Gilmore with that movie, and <laughs> I use a lot of the photos. I use a lot of photos from Happy Gilmore on my Facebook to explain my day. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I can tie Happy Gilmore to just about anything. So. Um, so the feud or not the feud, but the brawl and, you know, much like myself, Roe reads the 411 mania reviews. They called this brawl boring and pointless and flat and all. I don't know what they were watching. This to me was, was one of the best brawls in a very long time. I'm not putting up there, you know, classic, you know, Brock Lesnar and the undertaker. And stuff. I'm not, I'm not putting it up there like with a classic by any means, but this was one of the best brawls I've seen on wrestling in a while, especially on impact. The last one we got was like Gail Kim and Sienna had uh, very little heat to it. This had a lot of heat and Alberto El Patron is a very passionate wrestler. So that's, I think that's what bugged me, you know, um, at bound for glory. He just, he showed very little passion, whether it was in his promo or the attack afterwards. I thought, I thought it was really lacking, but for the most part, very passionate guy. When Johnny Impact dove over the table and took him out, that was great too. You, you just had the five seconds where Alberto was like, Johnny Impact. And then all of a sudden he just dives and takes him out. Johnny Impact's like head first into the concrete, almost took McKenzie out. Brilliant. And it just started off with heat. They went all over the arena. I liked when Johnny Impact jumped off the bathroom, the one that Dave Meltzer questioned. I don't know how they're going to put a bathroom in the Aberdeen Pavilion. I don't even know why he would care. He was just trying to find something negative to talk about. But there's plenty of times where you go to sporting events, wrestling events, and they have to to um, get up, you know, take a uh, have a pod delivered and create a bathroom. I mean, get get the hell out of here, Dave Meltzer. But so I don't even know if that was some kind of shot at him um, by doing that, showing the bathroom. But him jumping off the top, I mean, I was I was so into this. I heard the crowd was really, really into it. They actually got to see it on the big screen, which they're not always good about doing. And and then they brawled into the ring, and I just thought it had a great deal of heat. I was excited. It made me care about the two of them. And it built a heat that Johnny Impact and Eli Drake never had, not even close. So, Adam, what do you got on the brawl? Uh, well, first of all, it, it reminded me of um, the Roddy Piper film, They Live. John Carpenter film. And I don't know if either of you have seen it, but in the middle of that film, there's a brawl between uh, Roddy, Roddy Piper and I can't remember the guy's name, but he's trying to get him to put on glasses. But the brawl goes on for about 10, 15 minutes in the middle of the film. And you just, <laughs> it's, it was like that. It just went on 
forever and ever. But it was entertaining the whole time. Even the bits where, you know, where it looked like he was going to jump off and then suddenly all, all of the security guys were going, no, 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 all at once. <laughs> And yeah, then it, 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 cut, it cut away to a different angle, obviously, after he got his breath back. Uh, and then we came back and he did it anyway. But I, I just found it great. And um, it, even the bit where uh, he insulted uh, Al Patron saying, you know, you're not even the pride of your father. That's the first time that Johnny Impact has delivered a line that, since he's got here that actually felt vicious. Everything yeah. else just seemed like I'm monotone going through a scripted promo. So it was good. Mm-hmm. It was really good. I enjoyed it. And as you said, these two in one show have been more interested in the whole Eli Drake, Johnny Impact feud was for the last three months. Yeah, I'm super interested in it. And him hanging by his arm, it was, was very funny too. Um, and, and then he fell down. <laughs> I don't know. Just <laughs> About two feet. You mean? There's other men where he's yeah. hanging up. The, uh, he's going to fall and then he falls two feet. Yeah, yeah like two feet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, and the ran the really random part before we go to row was the uh, inclusion of Braxton Sutter and Caleb Conley. <laughs> so uh, I, I feel like Impact was taking shots at the dirt sheets through all this. Um, you know, a lot of people felt that Imp- Johnny Impact driving in his car was a shot at like Ryan. S- I don't think so, but uh, a shot at Ryan Satin and try to report that Impact was paying for their own parking. Um, I did research and that wasn't true. And they actually all bust to the arena. But um, just ridiculous. Uh, people felt that was a shot towards him. You know, I felt like maybe the Meltzer thing, jumping off the bathroom and showing that there was a bathroom in the Aberdeen Pavilion. And um, and the whole thing with Braxton Sutter, they reported that Braxton Sutter wasn't at the tapings. So I just thought that was, it was almost like they were playing with the dirt sheets. You know, it could all, all be a complete coincidence. But just kind of funny and i understood the braxton sutter part because i mean he was just a bystander but like caleb conley randomly run and this is the second time i think caleb conley has jumped into a brawl i think he did like last week or the week before and it made no sense whatsoever especially since he's kind of part of an angle not an angle but a you know with a call of lee really really random um but that was that was the only knock on it really ro what did you think of the brawl the brawl I like that. <clears throat> excuse me. I like that there was continuity from what transpired at Bound for Glory. Um, I would have only had a problem with it, say, if Eli would have had a title match or had some kind of match, because I feel the champion should close out the show. But um, this was fine. Um, this gives them something to do, keeps them out of the title picture. I'm assuming. Um, I'm hoping that it is a coincidence like you were alluding to as far as, you know, with Braxton Sutter being shown on TV and the bathrooms and whatnot, because the last thing they need to do, they can't worry about so much the dirt sheets because you're not going to please them. Like they have their audience who they cater to no matter what you do, even if, you know, the company's moving, um, trajecting upward, you know, you're not going to get be in their good graces. So, um, but as far as the the whole brawl, it did go a little bit long, but it was fine. Um, I'm interested to see what these two do moving forward. Yeah, I, I'm excited and interested in everything that they set up in this in this episode. I mean, from from Seidel and EC3 to the OVV and LAX. You know, by by now, I'm not going to get into the exact match against people in case people don't know. They do have a six man tag match next week, but the feud does continue. And the match that they ultimately have is supposed to be uh, something to watch, something you don't want to miss uh, when they add a stipulation. Um, I'm I next week they're they're teasing what's going on with Gail Kim. Unfortunately, I know what's going to happen with the Knockouts Championship because someone felt the need to post it as a spoiler in the comments of one of the videos. wasn't appreciated at all. Um, I, I deleted that comment. I might have blocked that person. I don't remember. And um, I'm excited to see where this goes too. I don't know what Eli Drake's gonna do. I think um, just you know, get having him get the little match with P.D. Williams and everything is cool. I would imagine he's gonna win that match, and um, that's probably gonna set up the next challenger for him. I have no idea who could challenge this guy at this point. No idea. Moose. That that makes some sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends. I mean, did we? See, I don't think we saw anything about Moose or America's Top Team if that angle's finished. Obviously, you know, uh, you know, 
you can read spoilers out there. But I, were they, I can't even remember if they were mentioned on the show, were they, this week? They, 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 they were. Little... They had a little segment, and then they said they're going to be at the show next week. Yeah, so it looks like that that's not finished. So um, it, I, I don't know who, who's next for Eli after uh, P.T. Williams, but it would make sense possibly to move him away from Adonis, maybe have a little mini feud with him. I don't know, possibly. that That's one angle could, they could go. Um, especially if Al Patron could be the next title contender after his Johnny Impact feud, uh, because obviously Lucha Underground's coming back for season four, so we don't know if Johnny Impact's going to stay around on both, who knows. So it could very well be Al Patron's the next big challenger, in which case Eli needs to be a, a face for it, in which case going against Adonis might be, uh, might be a way of turning him face. From what I understand in regards to Lucha Underground, is that um, obviously some contracts are going to be more lenient than others. From what I understand is that if a wrestling talent is on Lucha Underground, they cannot portray that character on Impact Wrestling. Um, so Phantasma is not, uh, God, what the hell is his name? Uh, King Cuerno on Lucha Underground. I know Drago was the same character. However, that's always uh, been his name so as far as I know. And you can't, when someone has a um, a ring name that they have trademarked to themselves, they you know you cannot say well you can't use that somewhere else. It's usually when you we learned that with the Hardys when you create a character for a specific show you cannot take that character to another another company. So that's why Johnny Muno is Johnny Impact. Uh, Taya is Taya Valkyrie on Impact Wrestling, so she's not Taya Valkyrie in, in Lucha Underground. Um, Sammy Callahan is Sammy Callahan. He is not. Uh, what the hell, Crane, uh, Sol no, Solomon Crow. Oh, man, his names are also like similar to me. Uh, whatever Crane he is on uh, Lucha Underground, it's escaping me right now. If you, if you portray a, a, sem a different character, I believe that is the, the loophole through it. Unless so, it's your real name. Unless it's your real name, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, not, not too concerned. You know, Brian Cage is Brian Cage in, in, on uh, Lucha Underground. He's recently liked... Uh, or followed Impact on Twitter, and they followed him back, I believe. So he's he's going to be a rumored name. But yeah, um, it's funny actually, just about the rumored names. And I know we talk about it all the time about ex WWE guys coming in and taking top spots and all. But I was almost a little bit disappointed that there wasn't a big name that came out at Bound for Glory. Uh, I, you know, I would like to have seen either a Jack Swagger or a, a Ryback or something like that. I, I know they may not be everyone's cup of tea, but I would have actually liked to have seen it. I would love to have seen Austin Aries come back. Um, but yeah, I was, I was a bit disappointed with Sammy Callahan and, and Jimmy Jacobs being the only two that that, that we've seen so far. And I, I'm not even sure if anything else is coming. So I was a bit disappointed. Yeah, Ro, do you, do you feel like, you know, there's always a mixed bag on former WWE guys, but the main event scene is very thin right now, especially James Storm is, is out. And James Storm hasn't been in the main event scene, but but he you can insert him into the main event scene very easily, and they've done that many times. They they really lack that that person right now that could uh, challenge for Eli Drake. Or right now it's like a it's it's Eli Drake. You know you can say EC3, but he's in the mid card at the moment. Eli Drake, Johnny Impact, and uh, El Patron. Like there's nothing else. You, you can throw in there. You can you, you can try to factor Eddie Edwards in in there, but you know what would what would you say? What would you think? Do you feel like at this point, okay, you gotta get a Jack Swagger, you gotta get a Ryback. Um, I, I think Austin Aries is a must. I don't know if they can pull that off or not. Do, oh. I mean, do, do, do you feel like even if they gotta go the WWE guys, they, they they gotta they gotta throw something in this main event scene? I'm I'm more of the mindset, and I'm a big advocate of utilizing what you have. And I mean, I know it might be perceived as they don't have much, but um, I think this is forces them to create new stars. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. I know we've only seen bits and pieces of Brax Braxton Sutter. I'm using him as an example, but who knows, man? I mean, there's been countless times in history where we've seen guys that seemed like enhancement talent, or you know, they were pigeoned for this particular role. You know, somebody in creative believes in them, gives them the push. Next thing you know, multi-time multi champion. I'm of the mindset, I, I want to see this before he, I mean, I don't know what his contract status is. I really want to see an EC3 Eli Drake title feud. 
I feel like we we um, I know they feuded in the past, but I think that's there's money in that. And then you got Moose. And I think having the if you have Eli Drake feud with those two guys right there in the meanwhile, build up some new contenders. I just don't like because the, the whole going to the WWE route, they go to that well far too much. I feel like it worked with, you know, and this is stemming back to back the old days when they did it with Christian Cage and, um, you know, Kurt Angle. Those were fine, but then they just kind of just grab anybody. And we've seen, like, even with um, Aaron Rex, for example, some of these guys that you're pulling, you know, you're thinking they're going to be big stars here. Sometimes they just don't, you know, resonate with the crowd like they anticipate. And that's TV time and, you know, other things that you've invested to try to propel this person who isn't at the level that, you know, you were anticipating. So I'd really like to see them you know, utilize from the roster that they have try to create stars from there. And, um, you know, Eli, there are a couple other guys Eli could feud with before you really kind of run out. I know Eli, I mean, excuse me, not Eli. EC3 is a grand champ, uh, title champion. But, um, you know, if he drops the title, he can move into a program with him. I, I, I really want him to be done with El Patron and um, Impact as far as now. Johnny Impact. Do you think that Gaza Jr. was the guy they had lined up? Um, because he, he was obviously injured at Bank for Glory. So do you think maybe that was the guy that they were lining up to go next? I I thought with the Garza Jr., maybe it's just me, you know, thinking too far along. I thought what was going to happen was they were going to have Garza Jr. cost Impact the match and then Impact and Garza feud. And then that kind of be a way to integrate Garza into the main event scene, you know, where, you know, his whole point of him interfering with the match is, hey, I don't want to be looked past. I want to shot my shot, too. Um, I think, you know, they had a good idea. They put him in there, let him mix him up. And then I don't know if it was his injury or what, whatever else transpired, but then they decided, oh, okay, we just throw him in the X Division match. Here's what I think about Garza Jr. I've been doing a lot of thinking about this. I think that the Garza Jr. spot that was so random on impact the last few weeks where he came down, remember there was the... Uh, there was that one brawl where he randomly came down and so did LAX. And then he was in the main event scene and then ended up in the impact in the, uh, grand not, I'm sorry, the X division scene. I think creative threw him in low keys spot at the tapings. Oh, that makes sense. I think low key perhaps broke away from LAX and inserted himself into the main event scene had another match with Johnny Impact, and ultimately ended up in the X Division, which is what upset him, and he left. You think so? Yeah, I really do. Well, I mean, you know what? It's so crazy, because when you think about it, you know, had the whole El Patron suspension not happened, I was of the mindset that Loki was going to beat him for for the uh, championship. But, um, you know, once they decided to go with Eli Drake, I, I just thought what frustrated him was it wasn't so much him not winning the belt, but uh, them not keeping him in the mix. I do think he would have stayed with LAX just because, you know, with LAX, you know, you had the tag team and then, you know, the potential in uh, Diamante challenging for the in the knockouts division, but they never really had a guy to challenge for that world belt. And um, that's what Loki presented. So I think, you know, when they were deciding or, you know, coming up with the Bound for Glory plans and the matches and, you know, when it came up to Loki, you know, I think had it been like a triple threat and you were putting them in the main event, you know, Eli, Impact and Loki for the global title, you know, you've been fine with it. But they pretty much just said, oh, we're going to have a multi uh, X Division match. And Loki, yeah, we're going to throw you in. I think that probably pissed him off. Just my take, though. Yeah, I, I'm I'm rolling with that because you, you remember there was the uh, the segment where Garza and Impact were like had all this heat all of a sudden, and you know Jim Cornette's like, you guys you guys got a problem with each other? You want to fight? We're gonna have a number one contendership. I, I just there was no heat between those guys. They 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 created it, and I just really think that I think it was Loki's creatively. I think they just uh, inserted him into Loki's uh, the spot. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, yeah, it makes sense to me, but uh, yeah. Anyway, 
So he could, I think if he wasn't injured, he possibly could have been the person that was in P.T. Williams' spot now. I don't know. Who knows? But, uh, yeah, as, going back to the, the whole WWE coming in, I can see where Rose coming from. And I think if they did bring in, you know, they could easily bring in a Ryback or Jack Swagger and then have him feud with EC3 in the mid-card and take the title and then move EC3 up. And I think that is a smart move. But uh, you're right. I think it should be the homegrown talent pushing for the top spot and let the WWE guys who come in have to earn their rate their way up. I, I agree, but here's my issue with that. And usually I'm not really big on them bringing someone over to be in the main event scene, but the problem is there's no mid-card title. The Grand Championship in EC3's own words, uh, in character and out of character, is that that title means nothing. And it's like you've got the X Division and you've got the main event scene. And without that mid-card title meaning anything, it's it's very hard to build up. You know, I, the only people they could build up would, would originate in the X Division, like Matt Seidel or something like that. I can't see anyone else that they can do something with to get them in that in that main event scene. I feel like the, you, there has to be a transplant. Like, or you, I feel like you have to bring some people in for the main event scene. I, I don't I don't know who they could build up. They, but you know, that's just the booking though, because if you think about it, I thought Moose, when he was carrying the grand title, he benefited from the most. And in some ways, I mean, before he, you know, started this feud with, you know, Lashley and America's top team, I mean, he was projected next, you know, I, I remember, I don't know if it was around the time where he signed the new contract, but you know, I was of the mindset 2018, Moose is going to have that title you know, the global world title. I just think this is just an example of them putting a mid-card title on the wrong person. I was happy when EC3 won it, just for the simple fact I felt like it gives it a prestige because this is a multi-world um, champion carrying your mid-card belt. So whoever beats him from it is going to really get that rub. But, you know, they haven't done anything with it. And I mean, I know a lot of people are are thinking, well, maybe they should go to TV title. Or, they got to commit to it. They've, they've done it at this point. I mean, you can drop the rules and just treat it as a mid-card belt. I feel like it can be salvaged. But if you go and scrap it or, or, or uh, um, I don't know, you know, create a new title or have another title or whatever the case may be, I just think it does it a disservice. But if they just invest it in it, and I think this feud with uh, EC3 and Sidel will be really telling as far as the future with the grand title, it can be that belt that helps elevate talent to the main event picture. Can't disagree. You know, you know what would have actually helped this title out a lot as if as if um, Moose was still the champion and at Bound for Glory he faced Lashley under those rules. There you go. I think that would have made it important. It would have, you could have painted a, uh, a story where you know um, Lashley was going to use MMA style moves because this was his type of match, and Stefan Bonner could have helped Moose um, develop a develop a style. You could have put him in Moose's corner, and then King Mo in uh, Lashley's corner again, or just American Top Team in, in general. Yeah, I think that would have done a lot for the title, especially if Lashley won it. I think that's a brilliant idea. It's a shame they, they didn't go with that. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, having said that, I didn't mention that about the Bound for Glory. I thought I, I quite enjoyed uh, that match, even though it was stupid. But yeah, I quite enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I, I, say that, I say that about all wrestling. I quite enjoyed it because it was stupid. But there you go. I, I appreciated them doing something different. I'm always as a, if, if you, they, you do something different, you will get my attention. Even if it's bad, I, I can always appreciate going on a limb and trying something new. So, kind of worked for me. Uh, closing thoughts, uh, Row, on Impact at all? Um, I'm excited, very optimistic. Um, that was just my biggest thing walking in. You know, with this new regime changes, I, I really want to see this new creative. And it just looks like so far so good. It's off to a good start. My closing thoughts. Uh... Yeah, I thought it left me wanting more at the end of the episode, which is what a good episode should do, in that you want to see what happens next. And for that all intended purposes, it did that. It did feel a complete uh, change to what we've previously been seeing on Impact. You know, just the whole taping, booking, everything about it seemed, seemed like a reboot again. Uh, that, I don't know how it's going to fit with me, because I quite liked the direction they're going in before, but... 
yeah, I give it a chance. But as a show, as a standalone show, my first time watching it, I would want to tune in next week. So I, I think well done. Absolutely. Crowd was great for it. They were engaged. Wrestlers were engaged with them. And um, I thought it was good. I, I really, really do. And um, my closing thought, I really think they need to make this set of tapings about the knockouts division. You have some new girls and uh, a vacant title. Um, I think I think this, this set of tapings is has an opportunity to make the knockouts division from top to bottom really special, really strong. And then, you know, next set of tapings comes comes around and you're able to do Rosemary and Taya and the Red Wedding, which they have teased that they will still do. You know, all of a sudden the knockouts division can be back. It really can. If if they you know, with with as thin as the main event scene is right now, put a little fo and we know there's no tag teams, put some extra focus on the knockouts and I think it's really gonna work out moving forward. So Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. And I think this gives them an opportunity where, you know, the knockouts like, you know, we had been talking about with L V N and um, I can't think of, you know, I guess Ali too, you know, getting lost in the shuffle. This gives them an opportunity to establish their kind of their four, you know, main knockouts. And then while you have the the young ones that you're trying to develop. So they got an opportunity to really um, get it right. Hell yes. That will do it for Adam Rowe and myself. Please hit subscribe, whatever channel you are checking us out on. It is the Impact Lounge. Thanks for swinging by. Peace.